All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. This is our Sunday night sutra study here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Michael. Uh, and tonight, tonight should be an interesting night. So the theme tonight is, well, the theme tonight is akshobia, which is an interesting word, and it means imperturbable. So the theme tonight is imperturbability, which is, it's kind of a mouthful. So we're, we're going to talk even just about language, about what that means. Um, but just as a reminder where this is coming from, so we're reading a sutra, as we do every Sunday night, but we've been reading this one for a while. We're kind of slowly making our way through it. And it's a sutra about a bodhisattva, uh, the bodhisattva Manjushri, and it's about bodhisattva Manjushri's pure land. We haven't actually gotten to Manjushri, to the pure land. We, we haven't gotten there yet. It's kind of a long sutra. And so what has actually happened so far, well, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of different things that have taken place. But we've reached a point in the sutra where the Buddha has been asked about bodhisattvas, the practice of bodhisattvas, and in particular, this idea of purifying a Buddha land, like sort of purifying a realm in that way, an interesting idea. And so in the sutra, a monk, a monk named Shariputra, who sort of is, as I teach it, of course, kind of representative of this early form of Buddhism, the more monastic form of Buddhism. And Shariputra has questions, <laughs> has questions for the Buddha about the Bodhisattva path. And we've, we dealt last week with the first part of the Buddha's answer. And the Buddha basically outlined four qualities of a bodhisattva that would kind of make sure, let me get the language right, it's these four qualities that would, well, it would ensure that they fulfill their aspirations, meaning their aspiration for enlightenment, their aspiration for anuttara samyak sambodhi, and all of that. So we learned about these four qualities. Um, and that was sort of the introduction just to the idea. Um, basically, the idea of having a mind set on enlightenment, that was the first quality. It's not something that you can just say once, like, I'm going to become a Buddha someday, and then go back to business. <laughs> so one of the qualities of a Bodhisattva is they have that foremost in mind. They're compassionate towards all beings, greatly determined, and they attend to Kalyana Mitra, to spiritual friends or spiritual teachers in that sense. So those four things will do it, those four qualities. And that's what we talked about last time. And then the way that this sutra reads, it's kind of one of those unfortunate things that we can't kind of read it all in its entirety. And I say that because it goes on to say, the Buddha goes on to say, Shariputra. Additionally, so in addition to that, if a bodhisattva has one quality, their aspirations will not degenerate or degrade, and they will purify an abundance of Buddha lands. What is that one quality? Shariputra. It is when a bodhisattva trains in and aspires to the conduct practiced by the Tathagata Akshobhya when he was a bodhisattva. So even before I read any further, <laughs> This sutra presumes you know about something, right? Because you may have never heard of the Bodhisattva Akshobhya. 
And you certainly may not have heard about the, the, the Buddha Akshobhya before he was a Buddha. So let's start there. I don't know if we'll get much further than that. Let's see. So this sutra, as I've mentioned many, many times, this sutra is part of a larger collection of sutras. That larger collection of sutras is called the uh, Ratnakuta collection, the, the, the pile of jewels. It's 49 different sutras that are traditionally am anthologized, if you will, together. They're usually collected together, but almost all of these sutras have lives of their own meaning they circulated independently and many of them even have their own kind of independent schools of Buddhism associated with them. The point is, is that one of the 49 sutras is the Sutra on Akshobhya Buddha's Pure Land. In particular, actually, it's about the array of virtues of Akshobhya Buddha's Pure Land. So that's a whole other sutra that occurs in this collection and it occurs pretty early on. Yeah, it's number six. So it's, we're reading, the sutra that we're reading from is the 15th sutra in the collection. And so sutra number six is this sutra dedicated to this whole other Buddha called Akshobhya. And I want to talk a little bit about that Buddha Akshobhya, but more importantly, I want to talk about the word Akshobhya and what it means, which is this idea of imperturbability. Um, so that, again, is the kind of the theme or the focus for tonight. So let's start with, where should we start? Well, let's, so that we can have a visual. Let me show you a picture of Akshobhya. I've been looking for a good picture, and unfortunately, all of the art books I have are more statuary for some reason. I've realized almost all of the Buddhist art I have, or art books, it deals more with statues. And it's actually hard to distinguish different Buddhas when they're statues, because a lot of it has to do with their body color and things. So here's Akshobhya. So if you're not checking out the screen, check it out right now. This is off my phone, so I apologize. But you'll notice right away he has a blue body. You'll also notice right away he has a crown. In particular, I want you to notice, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it with the glare, and I apologize again, but his hand, oh, there it is. Well, come. you'll notice his hand is in a position where it's touching the ground. So blue body, crown, right hand touching the ground. Those will be, I might reference a few other iconographic points, but that's Akshobhya. Akshobhya is the Buddha of the Eastern direction. So, to, tonight, I'm going to be probably mentioning a few other Buddhas to contextualize Akshobhya. And so I just want you to know there are this, there's this sort of, um, well, it's not a pantheon, it's kind of a Buddha-thon or something like that, right? So it's this world of all these different Buddhas. And I want to talk about that tonight. Like, you've probably heard of these other Buddhas, you might have kind of seen the iconography or something like the image I just showed you. So let's start talking about that. So there's a lot I could say about this. It has a lot to do with art, iconography, as I've already mentioned, but it's also kind of a really interesting aspect of Mahayana Buddhism. You, you do not hear about Akshobhya Buddha and these other Buddhas in earlier Buddhism. In the earliest form of Buddhism, in what they call the Hinayana, they will talk a lot about the past Buddhas that existed eons and eons and kalpas and kalpas ago. 
And in some sutras of the early tradition, they speak of seven Buddhas of the past, with our Buddha being like an eighth. They speak of 48 Buddhas of the past. The early Buddhist tradition has an understanding that there have been other Buddhas, but the idea is, is that those were all way, 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 way long time ago. And the last time a Buddha was around was about 2,500 years ago in India. That's the idea that in the early tradition, we got our Buddha. Our Buddha unfortunately died a long time ago, but our realm has already had its Buddha. And the next Buddha, Maitreya, isn't coming, isn't going to arrive on earth for thousands of years. That's according to the early Buddhist tradition. But I just want you to know that even in the early tradition, there was an idea of multiple Buddhas. They were just understood to sort of be all in the past. Akshobhya Buddha, the blue-bodied Buddha I just showed you, Akshobhya, it, well, it, this is, it gets really complicated because I'm going to read to you briefly from Akshobhya's sutra. And the idea is, is that this, it's a story within a sutra. So we're already kind of at this recursive meta level here where we're reading a story. And then within the story, there's a story about Akshobhya. And it says that it, it, that this took place a long time ago, but then there's very much an understanding that this Buddha is alive and well in the world, accessible, accessible to us in some way. And this is where these traditions will now fork off. And you'll get one type of Buddhism that says, no, no, these, these Buddhas live on other planets. And I've met Buddhists that have understandings that these Buddhas live on other planets. Other dimensions, other realms is an option. Or these Buddhas are, and this is the one I'm going to actually lean into a little bit tonight. There's a way of looking at these Buddhas as qualities of Shakyamuni, you know, Siddhartha, like our, the historical Buddha, as a historical personage, that Buddha lived and died, so to speak, but we can speak about certain qualities of that Buddha experience and then sort of personify that quality as a Buddha. <laughs> And so one of the qualities of a Buddha, one of the qualities of the Buddha is imperturbability. Just to make this start to make a little bit of sense, I want you to know that there's another Buddha named Amitabha or Amitabha. Amitabha or Amitabha is a um, red, a red-bodied Buddha. That Buddha is from the Western direction, and that Buddha is very associated with compassion, also as an aspect or a quality of a Buddha or a quality of the Buddha. So when we take or think about the, the deep, infinite compassion of a Buddha, that becomes sort of personified, personified as Amitabha, the, whose name means infinite life or infinite light, depending on whether it's Amitabha or Amitabha. So a name that has different, a slightly different meaning based upon the pronunciation. But the point is, is that if we wanted to sort of focus on the compassion aspect of Buddhism or Buddha, you think of Amitabha, but if you want to think about the imperturbability of a Buddha or the Buddha, then you're thinking about the blue-bodied 
Akshobia. So again, I'm only giving you right now one interpretation of these other Buddhas. I just wanted to be clear that this is only one among many ways of thinking about these things. So let's dig a little deeper. One of the things that you might not be aware of is in the traditional classical life story of the Buddha, uh, which is to say the story of Siddhartha, you might be familiar with the general arc of that story, you know, the, the Siddhartha leaving the palace, going to the forest, practicing uh, renunciation, practicing meditation. And then if you're familiar with the part of the story where the Buddha finally determines to become enlightened alone, by which I mean, he had already exhausted the teachings of all the other teachers and had found all of the different teachings of meditation and yoga, um, well, just incomplete. And so he decides to go it alone, so to speak. And underneath the Bodhi tree, Mara, right? The evil one whose name means death, right? Mara comes to try to, well, to try to defeat the Buddha or defeat Siddhartha be from becoming a Buddha. And so Mara, the evil one, famously, um, not, it's not challenges, but the famous three ways in which Mara tries to defeat Siddhartha, the three things correspond to the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion. Um, and actually within the context of the story, it's usually anger, greed, delusion. And those three poisons, the three kleshas, are personified, or not personified, but they are captured in the story by Mara first slinging a bow with a thousand arrows and shooting all th thousand arrows at the Buddha. This is basically trying to kill him, <laughs> uh, but also very much trying to get him angry, defend himself, um, all of that. To which the Buddha responds with the Abhaya Mudra. So the right hand out in front with like this. So the Abhaya Mudra is the Mudra of fearlessness. And of course, when the Buddha made the gesture of fearlessness, the arrows turned to flowers and reigned over his body, which is a beautiful way of speaking about a Buddha, the Buddha, overcoming fear, fearlessness. So now Mara has, has failed. And so that's when Mara conjures up these kind of dancing women, right? To try to basically arouse Siddhartha and try to stimulate him to get him out of his meditative state. The Buddha responds to, the, to Mara's dancing uh, ladies with the gesture that goes like this. So you might see a Buddha with a gesture, and this is a gesture of giving, gesture of generosity. So the idea is, is that in a situation where the sexual urge would normally have provoked Siddhartha to take in that sense, he responds with a gesture of giving. And that is said to display, well, to counteract that stimulation, but also to display the Buddha having overcome desire. So greed, or sorry, Anger, fear, check. Desire, check. Can't get him with that. That only leaves the third of the three poisons. The third klesha is delusion. But it's always important to remember that in Buddhism, when we talk about the three kleshas, when we talk about the third klesha of moha, this confusion or delusion, 
as far as I have read it and understand it, it's not a general delusion or a general confusion. It's actually kind of specifically about thinking there's a self there when there's not a self there. That's the delusion. So the delusion or the moha, the confusion, that, that klesha, it has a lot to do with the self. And then you can think of, of narcissism and selfishness. You can think of those things, but it runs much deeper than narcissism. Narcissism is just some sort of, you know, manifest quality of believing that there's a self there. So, so how does the Buddha defeat that? Well, what's interesting is, is how Mara tries to get Siddhartha to display his delusion is he, at least in the version of the story I've heard, they, Mara basically says, you're trying to escape my realm. You're trying to escape samsara. That's, that's my realm. What gives you sort of the right to escape? And the idea of that is that basically, and, and then now this is based on the um, commentary and interpretation, but the commentary tradition is that Mara was basically trying to get Siddhartha to speak from a place of the self, to speak from a place of ego. And then that would reveal he's still deluded, still confused, and now Mara would win by that. And it's kind of a trick in that way. Right. Because it's like, you know, if you meet somebody that says or even claims, you know, this kind of enlightened state of no self and it's like, oh, yeah, how did you get that? Or, you know, and, and there's a way that linguistically you could try to sort of um, trap somebody back into speaking from a place of self. So rather than saying why he's a kind of. Um, earned the merit to escape samsara in that way, rather than saying anything, the Buddha performs the mudra that is called the Bhumi Sparsha. And that's the mudra that I just showed you that Akshobhya has. One, the left hand in the lap and the right hand touching the ground. So usually it's like the knee with the hand right there, but it's called the Bhumi Sparsha the bumi, bumi is the ground, is the earth. And to, and sparsha, if you know your 12 link chain of causation, you know one of the links is sparsha, contact, coming into contact with the body, with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and so on. So to touch the earth is the bumi sparsha. And when Siddhartha makes the Bhumi Sparsha, in most of the stories, what happens is, is that there's an earth goddess. I've seen this goddess referred to as Gaia, but I believe that that's sort of mashing up some cultural traditions. But there is an earth goddess in traditional Hinduism who does sort of embody the planet, sort of, kind of. But it's upon this Bhumi Sparsha that the earth goddess appears and basically bears witness and makes this kind of declaration that as the goddess of the earth, her, she remembers everything. It's this beautiful sentiment that as the earth, she has a memory of everything. And so she recalls Siddhartha and all of these past lives that Siddhartha had gone through and says, and it's by virtue of all of that past practice, I bear witness that, that this Siddhartha person has, has kind of earned the, the, the right, so to speak, to be liberated from samsara. And that is basically what defeats Mara. Mara doesn't have any more tricks up his sleeve than greed, anger, and delusion. So 
that's sort of the context for the Bhumi Sparsha um, mudra. Now, what happens is, is that that moment when the Buddha is confronted with Mara in that way, and then makes this, this gesture, but it's an interesting gesture, this touching the ground. But in making that gesture, they speak about Siddhartha in that moment being Akshobhya. And there's this beautiful kind of thing going on with language where you can understand that as being imperturbable and being Akshobhya Buddha. And of course, if Akshobhya Buddha is the embodiment of imperturbability, then there's an interesting kind of conflation of ideas there. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so this Buddha that our original sutra, meaning the, the Manju Sri Pure Land Sutra that we're reading, when the Buddha says, if bodhisattvas have this one quality, their aspirations will not degenerate, right? And what's that one quality? Well, Shariputra, it's when a bodhisattva trains in and aspires for the conduct uh, practiced by this Tathagata Akshobhya, this Buddha Akshobhya, when he was a bodhisattva. Now, what we have here is Previously, when the Buddha Akshobhya was just a bodhisattva, he made the following declaration. If I do not go forth in all of my lifetimes, then I will have deceived the Buddhas. Shariputra, in the same way, bodhisattvas should emulate the example of the Buddha Akshobhya, or the, the Buddha Akshobhya's Bodhisattva conduct, Shariputra, Bodhisattva's training in this manner will go forth in every lifetime, whether a Buddha appears in the world or not, they will certainly leave the household life. And why is this Shariputra? It is because renouncing the household life is the greatest boon of Bodhisattvas. Okay. We've got a, a lot to do to unpack that. So that text references Akshobhya making this declaration that he will go forth, meaning he will leave the home life, not just in one lifetime, but for every lifetime until he attains Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi or becomes a Buddha. And the interesting language that the sutra employs is this idea that Akshobhya says, I, I, I make this vow or this aspiration to go forth in every lifetime, because if I don't, I'll be lying to the Buddhas. I'll be deceiving the Buddhas. All right. So I'm going to get back to that because I want to talk about what is what this sutra means by going forth. What does it mean by leaving the household life? We've actually already heard what it means by that, but let's hold off on that. For some reason, and I think it's actually a very interesting reason, this sutra has chosen to isolate and focus on Akshobhya Bodhisattva's or one aspect of Akshobhya Bodhisattva's vow, which is the vow to go forth or, or uh, leave home in every lifetime. But that's not, I mean, I know why, and I will tell you why the sutra chose to uh, focus on that. But in order to contextualize Akshobhya, the idea of imperturbability, I just want to read you a little bit of the original Akshobhya Sutra, right? So it's, again, this is a, one of the weird sutras where it's a story within the story. And in that story, we're hearing about 
the Bodhisattva Akshobhya, who was living in a Buddha land where the Buddha was called Wonderful Joy. Oh, sorry, the Buddha land is called Wonderful Joy. The Buddha is called Great Eyes. <laughs> so in that Buddha land, with that Buddha Great Eyes, there's this Bodhisattva Akshobhya. And Akshobhya decides he wants to make the Bodhisattva vow. So the vow to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which includes, of course, all sentient beings attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Because I, wanted to, I made that clear in an earlier session. The Bodhisattva vow is not just for one's own awakening. It's a kind of about universal awakening in that sense. And then the Buddha, good eyes, says to that Bodhisattva, Oh, Akshobhya. You should know that the way of a bodhisattva is very difficult. And why? Because a bodhisattva bears no malice against any sentient being. Thereupon, the, the bodhisattva said to the Buddha, world honored one, I now engender, generate or bring forth Supreme Bodhicitta, the supreme mind of awakening. I will seek all knowing wisdom, sarva jnana, omniscience, by doing away with crookedness and deceit, and by invariably always speaking the truth. If I bear malice against any sentient being from now until I attain enlightenment, I would be deceiving all the Buddhas who are now expounding the Dharma in numberless, countless, boundless worlds. And then Akshobhya Bodhisattva makes a series of vows. Now, he says, now I have resolved to pursue all-knowing wisdom and dedicate myself to this. And then it's a bunch of, I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's like, if I ever generate greed, anger, or ignorance towards sentient beings, or am prone to arrogance or misdeeds from now until I attain my enlightenment, I would be deceiving the Buddha. And then in this long list of aspects of Akshobhya Bodhisattva's vow, it includes the one of vowing to go forth in every lifetime. And if I don't go forth in every lifetime, I'd be deceiving uh, the, all the Buddhas. So I want to take a step back, though, because I really want to talk about this, like, imperturbability. <laughs> Again, that's the theme of tonight. Here, we have it spoken about in terms of generating malice or anger resentment, bitterness, all of these different aspects of, well, of dvesha, of this poison of aversion, this poison of, of anger in that way. And so just for a moment, like, uh, what's the expression, right? H uh, humor me, right? Just for a moment, Think about what it would mean to make a vow to never get angry at anybody or anything or anyone again. Wow. And I say that because I've been thinking about this all day. I've been thinking about this Dharma talk all day. And it's one of the things that it, for some reason recently like recently in the last like couple of weeks that it there's been something for me personally about anger and my own dealing with my own anger dealing with all of, you know on a very personal level a way in which i've become so aware of and I, i've been struggling about how to put this but yes the relationship between self and anger about how those are so like that basically, if you weren't trying to defend 
your sense of self in one way or another, could you get angry? Or is it actually always about that sense of self in that way? My point is I've just been noticing and not in any kind of um, uh, self-deprecating way. It's not like that, I promise. But every time I get angry, I'm realizing how unenlightened I am. It's like just a, just a wow. And, be, and especially when you get angry over petty, dumb, little things, that's when you really realize how kind of unenlightened you are in that way. And again, I'm saying this all, you know, pointing the finger at myself because I certainly don't ever like to talk about other people's state of enlightenment in that way. But I just putting it out there is something I've really been reflecting on regarding sort of like just again, anger is a litmus test for her enlightenment. <laughs> it's a litmus test. And it's just like, that's your, your, your indicator in that way. And what I want to say wrapped up in all of that, like, yes, I want you to humor me and be thinking about what it would mean to make a vow to never get angry again. But what I really kind of want to focus on is about like, well, it's about, oh, I mean, I guess I don't really need to say super much more, but this idea of perturbed, we probably, you, I don't use that word perturbed. What I, the word I use, the phrase I use is pissed off. I think you probably might be familiar with that expression. So getting pissed off is getting perturbed, if you didn't know. <laughs> like, so that's what perturbed means, right? And the idea is, is that akshobia doesn't get pissed off. Akshobia is the state of not getting pissed off, not getting angry, not getting perturbed in that sense. And the thing that I keep kind of wanting to get at is so if you if you're a regular dharma doors attendee or if you've just sort of you know come to my classes you know i work with you know i won't grab them but you know i work with a lot of optical illusions i i use a lot of visual representations as examples as upaya in that way and the thing about it is, is that I've realized that in doing that, I start to set up a, a kind of a certain way of thinking. And what I mean is, I recognize that in using too many visual examples, I may start to give the impression that as one becomes more awakened or more enlightened in that sense, I may have given the impression that something changes on a visual level <laughs> where like things actually start to look differently as if you're having a psychedelic experience or something. And I think what, I've, what I'm always actually trying to do with those visual examples, that my experience of awakening to the degree to which I've experienced any awakening my experience is, is definitely not been visual. It's entirely a heart thing in terms of something like anger, which is that I used to get angry a lot more and over even stupider things and it would last a lot longer. And as this has gone on for me, as this practice, as this life has gone on for me in that way, the one result of all of this practice that I've experienced, it's all in a heart center of not getting as angry, not being as anxious, better night's sleep, more joy, less depression. You used to have much worse, bad depression. Now it's pretty good in that way. Those are my uh, that's my experience. And I would say that nothing has really ever changed on a visual level. But when I'm using all of those examples of the visual to talk about characteristics or lakshana qualities and all of those, 
what I'm always trying to get at is the way in which these objects and these things, the way in which they're affecting us, the way in which they're getting us to feel a certain way. And I guess what I kind of want to get around to in that regard is this, and I'm, I apologize if this is kind of all over the place. Again, I've been trying to think of how to lay out all these different ideas. I want to go back to the anger one. I want to go back to the idea of making a vow like akshobia, of, of never engendering malice or anger towards any sentient beings. So there's one way to practice, and I would sort of associate this with earlier Buddhism, the earlier form of Buddhism. And as everybody knows, if you've come to Dharma doors, I have the, opinion, the Mahayana opinion of the earlier path that it's a little repressive, meaning that it's a, it, it kind of is a practice of repression a little bit, and, what, and I actually, what I want to really make clear is that it can be practiced in a way that's very repressive. I don't think it is inherently so, but my point is, is this, there's one way to work with anger, let's say, and that would be, and I'm thinking of just like a, a silly hypothetical scenario, but let's say you did the old thing where you you have the jar in the kitchen and every time you got angry you put a dollar in the in the jar right this is like a classic old way of dealing with different things right so that's one way of you know being cognizant of anger i suppose yeah that's one way to do it so the anger arises and you're kind of like, oh, I'm trying to be my bodhisattva path. I, oh, I deceived the Buddha's daughter. <laughs> like I got angry. So you put your dollar in the anger jar and, and it's like, okay. And then you get angry again. It's like, oh, darn, I got angry again. I deceived the Buddhas again. And you put another dollar in the jar, you know? And then of course, at the end of the month or whatever, you take that jar of money down, you donate it someplace, so you've transformed all of your anger now into generosity. Great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all, but here's the thing about it. What we really want in the Bodhisattva Mahayana path, what we really want is actually to not get angry because we know better. And what I'm getting at is it's not about repressing the anger and being like, oh, I did it again. It's actually about sort of from the Bodhisattva point of view of really recognizing how, and I say this, I've been saying it a lot on Sunday nights, but really recognizing how anger, only, it, it, it hurts yourself. And even though you might want it, to hurt the person that you're angry at, like that's what you would like it to accomplish. Oddly, it doesn't do that. Oddly, anger doesn't make people shrivel and cry and, and, and be, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I have seen the error of my ways. Now that you have gotten angry at me, I get it. It doesn't work like that. So, the reality is, is that what we hope to accomplish with anger doesn't actually accomplish that. And then we're just left being angry, <laughs> like having that nasty, bitter feeling in your stomach and esophagus and all of that, that you get that. So the Bodhisattva is kind of working on the wisdom side of things in sort of really recognizing, A, anger is a lose-lose situation. But then B, this is where the real bodhisattva work gets, gets going. This is an example I've used a lot. Apologies if you've heard this before, but it's just a really tight, clear example. It's very personal. Again, uh, it's you know a learning experience of, of my own. It has to do with back in the SFDC, the old days at the old location. 
um, when I would drive in to San Francisco, teach on Sunday nights. And, you know, sometimes on Sunday nights in the mission, depending on what's going on, it can be hard to find parking. So I'm sitting there driving around, driving around Folsom 24th, Folsom 24th. You, you probably all know the routine, right? And of course, oh, a spot. I'm going to get the spot. I see the person who has already passed the spot start to do the illegal turn in the middle of the road so that they can come back and get my spot. <laughs> and of course they took my spot and I got angry, very angry about that. Now, what was good about the situation is I was going, literally at that moment, going to teach a Dharma class. And so it was a great moment to catch myself and be like, bro, you cannot go teach a Dharma class in that angry chitta, in that angry mind state. So having that realization, having that moment of pause of, oh, I really probably should clear my, my head heart out <laughs> before I go try to teach people anything. And in that state, I did, I guess, what you might call vipassana, a kind of insight, which is basically kind of an analysis of where the anger come, came from. So I've already kind of gave, gave you one clue. It comes from that idea that it was my parking spot. So right there, we see the, the self, the idea of self emerge and own the parking spot. It's not my parking spot right? It's like kind of the cities, I guess, or whatever. But the point is to claim ownership of it. That's, that was my first mistake, right? That was the first delusion. But guy takes a spot, I get angry. But then I look deeper. And I start to realize, oh, no, there's a lot more going on here. Because what I realized was, but why would I like, why would I even care about my parking spot? And what I realized was like, oh, it's actually something that is like kind of been part of me my whole life. I don't like to be late for things. I, it's part of me. I mean, my parents probably instilled it in me in some way, shape or form. But the point is, is I realized I don't like to be late. Let's dig deeper. What's that all about? And then I got to it, which was about how, oh, I don't want to be perceived as irresponsible by being late. That's the sense of self. Michael as the responsible individual, that was the sense of self that this person, by taking my parking spot, they were about to screw up my sin. They were about to screw up my whole thing I had going on. I had this whole responsible image going on. And this person was about to ruin that. And so my point is, is that in that analysis of where that anger came from, all it had all over it was ego, ego, sense of self in so many different ways. And I learned a lot from that. Can't say I'm not, I don't get angry. It's not about that. But it was a deeper lesson in for me personally about what anger is kind of really about in that way. And then how foolish it is. And when I say that, when I say how foolish it is, of course, I'm speaking from somebody who's a 20 year Dharma teacher up here all the time talking about emptiness and no self and all of that. And here I am aggressively kind of attached to a certain notion of self and trying to defend it and yell at people and do all these things. So my point of that long kind of personal story is ultimately, you know, the bodhisattva, in, in my opinion, doesn't want to repress anger in that sense, actually wants to work on a mind state that is wise enough to not get angry and 
I say, you know, I say that with the utmost compassion and the utmost generosity in that way of, I understand that it's hard, it's difficult. It, I'm, not, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody but myself in that way and saying, like, just get over it. Like, that's not the message I'm trying to convey at all. It's just about really kind of analyzing anger in a really deep way and then coming to some understandings about where it's coming from. And, and then I'll return to my other point. And then really asking yourself is, how is this serving me? Like, how is this really helping me at all? <laughs> Maybe it's not helping at all. So now, contrast diluted, being angry over parking spots and all of that, contrast that state of delusion with a state of imperturbability. Totally chill, totally like uh, no amount of parking spots, right? It's like there's it, imperturbable imperturbable in every way. And I think I've said this a few times too, but for me, that being imperturbable, that seems like a superpower to me. That seems like, wow, how, how powerful of a place. And if you start to think about it that way of of being imperturbable as being very, very powerful and very, very strong, then you know what that means? And again, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody but myself, but then you can start to see anger as like, yeah, kind of weak. It's like if, if, if somebody is getting angry about something, you can start to see it as like a sign of weakness because you've been got to, you got got, and you might have gotten got by, you know, somebody saying something about you, a word, and you have gotten got to versus not of, of imperturbability. It's funny how when you start thinking this way and you're starting to look at anger that way, anger doesn't look so tough anymore to me. It doesn't look so strong and like, wow, look at, wow. It actually starts to look a little weak in that way. Whereas somebody who's super chill, super imperturbable starts to look like a warrior very, very strong in that sense. Okay. Everybody doing okay with this Akshobia vibe tonight? Cool. So Akshobia is about being in, imperturbable. Mara's coming at you with everything and you are immovable. You are imperturbable. The gesture of that state, again, is called the Bhumi Sparsha. And there's a really interesting thing <clears throat> about that where it kind of speaks to being grounded in both kind of an, an emotional sense that I've been talking about, but also because of the gesture, if you've ever dealt with electricity, grounding is, a, is serious, like you, it's how it works. And so there's an interesting connection there between the gesture of touching the ground and being grounded and that kind of electrical sense of being grounded. And I say that and I'm like, wow, that's weird. I, I, meaning the funny things in these Dharma talks. So you'll often see images of uh, either Siddhartha or Shakyamuni, but you'll see images of the, the Buddha, like the historical Buddha, underneath the Bodhi tree, doing the Bhumi Sparsha with hand in lap, Bhumi Sparsha. If it's Siddhartha, meaning it's like the historical Buddha, 
that person will probably usually be dressed in a saffron robe, so like as a monk, and have the 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 classic uh, ushnisha, just the classic little top, not a top knot, but the actual little bump on the head. So iconographically, it's very difficult actually to tell the difference between Siddhartha when he's making the Bhumi Sparsha and Akshobhya. Now, of course, you can tell right away if it's Akshobhya because he'll have a blue body. <laughs> and Siddhartha Shakyamuni never, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. He does sometimes have a blue-ish body, but a bright blue body is Akshobhya. Also, the crown. The crown is an indicator, but there's one other iconographic thing about Akshobhya that I just remembered when I was talking about being grounded, and this is very interesting. So you won't really be able to see it in, in my terrible phone image, but in his lap is a Vajra. So I don't know if you can see that. So that's, you can always definitely tell Akshobhya because he has the Vajra in the left hand. So kind of floating, kind of like, kind of like that. And of course, a Vajra is not a diamond. It's a lightning bolt. It's a thunderbolt. Interesting. This idea of being grounded and lightning and thunder and all of that. But that image, so, and again, apologies for this stitching all of this together tonight. But what's interesting about this symbol is I was mentioning earlier about Amitabha or Amitabha. That Buddha who is in the West is holding usually in his left hand, a lotus flower. And the lotus flower and the Vajra are the Buddhist version of yin and yang, of that kind of masculine feminine energy thing going on. Now, Buddhism is, is very, Mahayana Buddhism especially, is very, how could I put that? What, I don't even know how to say this, but let me put it to you a different way. <laughs> if you were to go to China and get into the Taoist tradition, the Taoist tradition, of course, is all about the polarities, all about yin and yang, which is in the Chinese Taoist tradition, very much about the masculine and the feminine. And those distinctions of male, female, masculine, feminine, yin and yang are very established in the Taoist tradition. And what that makes it, the Taoist tradition, it makes it a little and sometimes rather sexualized. I don't know how to put it but like where it's sexualized, where it's about masculine, feminine. Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, it doesn't get super male, female about it. It's the vibes are actually about compassion and wisdom, head and heart. And the point is, is that all human beings and creatures in that sense have intellect, have a heart. It's the Apollonian Dionysian in that sense. So the point is, is that the polarity is not so masculine, feminine as it is intellectual, emotional in that sense. Now, from times to time, this does become a kind of a phallic image and the lotus flower does become a kind of um, yoni, a kind of a feminine image in that way. But I would say that the predominant significance is compassion wisdom. With any sort of sexualizing of those being a little further down the ranks, 
in, uh, of importance. So that means akshobia is going to be more of this vajra, that kind of energy. And amitabha is going to be this more lotus compassion energy. So, all right. I got to get back to the sutra. Plenty of time for that. Anybody got any questions, comments, answers, ideas, though? Anything coming up? Feeling okay? Just a bunch of fun ideas, hopefully. Cool. So let's get back to the sutra proper. That was sort of just this really long way of describing akshobia. But in this, if I were to read this section, and I already read it, we'll read it again. But if I were to read it, outside of, out of the context of this sutra, I would be, I would think that they were talking about becoming a monk or a nun, renouncing, going forth, leaving the home life. And remember, the idea here is, is that the Buddha has told us that a bodhisattva's aspirations will not degenerate if they're like akshobhya, and they make the vow to leave the household life, not just in one lifetime, but for every lifetime until they attain enlightenment. If I were to read that out of context, I would think they were saying that the bodhisattva should be a monk or a nun, renounce, and make a vow to do that in every lifetime until they achieve enlightenment. That would be if we didn't read the whole first part of the sutra. And we learn in the first part of the sutra, let's see, where is it? So we learn that to go forth into homelessness is to, so, So in the earlier part, the Buddha describing the Bodhisattva path says, and what is to be avoided on the Bodhisattva path? Attachment, aggression, ignorance, and craving for the features of the household life. Renouncing these things, Bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise, and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. And what is the accomplishment of going forth? It is realizing all phenomena just as they are. What's realizing all phenomena just as they are, you may ask? All phenomena refers to the five aggregates, to sense elements, to sense objects as well as to all conditioned and unconditioned phenomena. And how are all of those things to be understood? They are understood to be illusory, void, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. They are understood in this way to the degree that one does not see them as being real. When there is no seeing, no knowing, no assuming, no thinking, no conceptualizing, no thinking of them as real, all concepts are pacified. And this is called truly understanding. Understanding the aggregates and the sense elements and all of that in this way, that is called the accomplishment of going forth. So the sutra defines what it's talking about in terms of going forth, and then goes back to the, where we're at in the text and says, a bodhisattva's aspirations will not degenerate if like Ikshobhya, they make a vow to leave home, not just in this life, but in every life. And so one of the reasons why I chose the sutra, one of the reasons why I teach Mahayana Buddhism basically is because in that path, one can leave home without 
becoming a monk or a nun. The idea being, if you heard, understanding emptiness, understanding this teaching, and then seeing all things in your house as they are, which is like illusions, like dreams, like shadows, as being unreal, if and therefore undesirable in that way. If you can uh, see things like that, that's the accomplishment of going forth. So let's remember that that's how this sutra defined leaving home and going forth when we hear about Akshobhya doing that lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So on that note about leaving the household life, but as defined by emptiness, one thing to think about, what is really, a, um, I don't know, for me, it's the key part of this. It's about bodhisattvas having no desire for the features of the household life, no desire for gain, honor, or praise, right? So one of the things to keep in mind, I don't often mention this, but I will tonight. When we talk about leaving home, going forth as it's called, of course, traditionally in the Buddhist tradition, that meant literally walking out your front door and literally going from the home life to homelessness, literally shaving your head, vows of celibacy and all of that. In the original context, in the original practice of Buddhism, leaving the home life had a few other things to it as well. I mentioned these, I think last week or some other time, but of course, when you leave the home life, you also give up your family name. You, you sever attachments to that family. And in India, in that context, it's important to keep in mind because we don't really uh, at least in my world, life, culture, American here, we don't have a caste system. We have, um, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no, we have social mobility. We have a class system, but we also have an idea of the ability to transcend class in that sense. If you're familiar with the caste system in India though, caste is something you're really born with. And it's not, there's, there is no social mobility per se. That's why some people are not really into the caste system in that sense. But my point is when you renounced in India, you were also giving up that status and cause of course, you could be a Brahmin. That's that like a high caste person. And you would be renouncing that. The point is, is that when this says that bodhisattvas have no desire for honor or praise, the idea is, is that those things in India were wrapped up in the household life in that way. Being of a certain caste, having a certain home, having a certain job, a certain social status, all of that was the household life. My point is, is that we might think of it as literally just going and sleeping on the streets. Like that that's what it means to renounce, is to be a homeless person. And again, in, in, in American culture, we don't have, again, for better or for worse, we don't have that kind of caste system that someone might renounce or that it would be an aspect of renunciation. So I just wanna remind you that in the original context of, of this, leaving the household life was about a lot more than just sleeping in the woods, right? Now, again, that of course is the original version where we were literally going out our front door. 
This Mahayana version, though, is focused much more on the desire for these things. Very, very different. And so just to sort of begin to start kind of tying all these threads together, we could, again, read this as literally renouncing and becoming a monk, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise that because I just don't think the sutra is actually trying to tell us that. I think the sutra is trying to say something more about, well, the, the problems of the household life. And what I mean by that is, is there's sort of like, well, let me just give you my other classic example. <laughs> the classic example I give about all of this is regarding my water bottle. So the idea is, is that I could claim ownership over this. It's mine, right? And I could do that. And then that would be a certain mental disposition towards this object, which is a state of possession or ownership. I own it, it's mine. And what's interesting about that is that when I own it, I can drink out of it. But then if I were to renounce my water bottle and say, you know what? I don't own this water bottle. It's up for grabs. I'm done. I don't own it anymore. And then I, do, I use the water. And the thing about it is, is that I drank water there. The first way, it was with ownership. And the second way was without ownership. And what's interesting is, is that the, the function of the whole thing, like staying hydrated and all of that, that was all the same. That was exactly the same. But what was different was my mental disposition towards the water bottle. And in particular, of course, when I own the water bottle and somebody comes along and grabs it, ah, I can get angry. I could get angry at them for stealing my water bottle because I own it, I possess it, it's mine. If I truly relinquish the water bottle, like honestly, not just in word, but in heart, I say, you know what? I'm done owning water bottles. <laughs> Somebody comes along and goes, Tink! and takes the water bottle. And I'm like, there goes the water bottle. No anger. Why would I get angry, right? That's like, you know, somebody picking something up over there that I don't own and me getting angry about it. Why would I get angry? I got nothing to do. I got nothing to do with that object. I've got nothing to do with that person. That person comes, picks up that object. No anger. Look at that. Super upeksha. When I don't own it, <laughs> I can be so equanimous when it's not mine, right? So what I'm getting at, thanks, Noe, what I'm getting at is my interpretation of this leaving the household life is about that changing one's disposition towards these things. One can be deeply invested in one's household life and, well, and you get everything that comes with that, right? Or one could see their, the roof over their head as the thing that's keeping the rain from falling on them. Not my roof, not my house, the house. And the idea here is, is, I hope you can kind of start to see how you could still live a life <laughs> with using stuff and doing all of that and you just have an entirely different emotional relationship to it all. So that, well, I would call it a healthier relationship to it all. Because, you know, last time I heard, everything's impermanent on that level. And so it's kind of nice to not be attached to stuff 
anyways, since it's impermanent, that was like the original teaching of the Buddha was about that. This is a little deeper, of course, because we're not talking about the impermanence of all of this. We're talking about the emptiness of all of this. And of course, the em to say the emptiness of all of this is saying something very specific about it all, right? It's not saying it's not real. It's not saying it doesn't exist. It's just saying that it exists in a certain way. And the way that things exist, and now we're talking, now we're doing an emptiness talk. <laughs> but remember, emptiness is about any phenomena, any, any, anything you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, even thinking about. And it's about how anything that we are thinking about in that way is ultimately a concept. And as a concept, things are kind of, well, not really tangibly real in that way, They're kind of an idea in that sense. And so it's not, well, first of all, insofar as things are real, they're definitely impermanent. Emptiness is kind of a deeper statement about the conceptual nature of all things in that way. And so when we start to understand the conceptual nature of all things, it can almost get to the point where we realize there's nothing there to be grasped at. There's nothing there to be desirable to begin with in that way. So this is sort of going back to the things I was saying about the Bodhisattva coming from a place of wisdom, where it's not about rejection of these things, meaning the household objects, the creature comforts. It's not about the rejection of them in that way, but it is about noticing, first of all, noticing the the dukkha producing aspects of things in that way. So that's sort of the first one is noticing and, and keeping in mind, right? That the whatever it is, the mortgage and the bills and all of these things are rather anxiety producing, right? So the nature of them, the nature of the household life in that way is rather stressful and stress producing in that sense. And so by freeing ourselves up from such an intense um, relationship with them and thereby renouncing them, but not renouncing them in a giving them away sort of a way, but just in that way I've been talking about, where it's about shifting your emotional disposition, that could hopefully, if this Dharma talk has been successful at all, you can see how that could start to lead towards being imperturbable. When we have attachments to things, we're perturbable. Because remember, when I got, when I'm attached to my water bottle, I'm setting myself up per, for per, perturbation or whatever it's called. I'm, because it's like, here it is. And then somebody's going to come and take it and I'm perturbed. But if I don't have that relationship to it, I start to become more and more imperturbable in that sense. So, all right. Questions, comments, answers, ideas, insights, realizations. No yeah, no way. I go. The uh, thank you. It's funny how my clinging mind then said, but if you're not perturbed, can that lead to some sort of nihilism? Like right. not getting involved, not getting. Yeah, so. Yep. Great, great question. So I know it's a great question because th that line of thinking makes total sense. It's like, yep. So. Let me do it this way.
the hmm it's a matter of time noe and so it's it's just making a nice answer for you the basic idea as i think of it and it has a lot to to do with the equation i set up tonight i set up an equ an equation which is about being perturbed and self and not just this idea of self it's about aspects of self right again i have this idea that i'm this type of person and if something challenges that i get perturbed in that way so the equation i set up was all about self and perturbation in that sense the the basic idea is and this is again noe this is why i'm struggling because i could give you a really long answer but i'm gonna have to kind of cop out a little bit and what the cop out a little bit is it's about a certain understanding that we kind of and this is this again i'm gonna just it's oversimplified but you can kind of see it as a movement that turns this way meaning towards self towards clinging and then the other movement is to the other compassion kindness generosity all of these things and so when if you understand my equation of self and perturbation when there's no self and we're imperturbable we are also now wide open for being compassionate and generous and giving because the the direction is not this way now i understand that there's a neutral state in between those where one is not clinging to self or outward and that's the more nihilistic uh, version there where it it goes to a kind of apathy and no i'm actually really happy that you asked this question because in this sutra in fact it was one of akshobhya's vows that i didn't read in all of these sutras, we're always hearing about the voice hearers and the solitary Buddhas, the Pratekya Buddhas, and the Mahayana tradition is not really a big fan of the Pratekya Buddha. And that's because the Pratekya Buddha sits right in that middle of no self, but also everything is empty all sentient beings are empty all phenomena is empty and therefore peace everybody i'm out and the mahayana says no 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 we need you we need your compassion and enlightened mind in our world and so the pratekya buddha again is it it it's short and the bodhisattva path is considered sort of full in that way because it well it's aiming for the awakening of all sentient beings in that way thank you thank you and someday the longer answer noe <clears throat> any other questions comments answers ideas excellent then i think rather than opening up another can of worms like i tend to do i think i'm just going to call it a night so thank you all everybody for being here i'm going to turn it over to tia for any sfdc news